Hello, this is Malcolm and Simone. What are we talking about today, Simone? Well, do you remember that time on Twitter where suddenly a bunch of muscular people started sending us pictures of themselves working out in skimpy clothing and also threatening to throw us into lockers? I do remember that time. That was fun. So <laughs> you may remember from our last post, we were talking about sort of the theory of Twitter. So we hadn't really used Twitter before Elon Musk acquired it just because it wasn't interesting to us. And uh, it, afterwards, it became sort of this collective, um, uh, it, it got more interesting, I'll say that. Uh, and so we were like, okay, let's let's give it a shot. You know, it's, it's back in the zeitgeist again. Um, and we really began to sort of learn how to use it. And one of the things was, was to piss people off. I mean, the easy especially communities, not just people. No, not people. Communities. Yeah, so and, when, and it was specifically communities with which people closely identified. So this isn't like model train enthusiasts. This is especially anything that is visually identifiable and part of how people see the core of their their personal identities. That seems to be where like you twist the knife. Yes, and so we decided to um was one of the ones we've done so often what we do is we try to take what a community thinks of themselves and then subvert it like that's the best way to sort of try to engage a community and one of these hooks was for the uh quote unquote swole community or the weightlifting community um because they're pretty big in the communities that are adjacent to us uh on on in, in online spheres so <laughs> we did a series of tweets um, that made a number of points that were sort of designed to invert what they, the way they want to be perceived. Um, so one was pointing out, uh, and this is like well backed by research. You can Google it. I love how people are like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I was a, I am a published neuroscientist. I have an exhibit that I worked on still on display at the Smithsonian. I know a lot about the way the human brain works and, and, and yeah, I, I actually do know what I'm talking about when it comes to stuff like this, um, is that when a person is in a, and, and we wrote a best-selling book on sexuality and relationships. So those are also tied to this. Uh, <laughs> when a person is, uh, in a long-term monogamous relationship, a male specifically, uh, but this also happens in females, their testosterone decreases pretty dramatically. Um, and testosterone is going to be much higher in individuals who are single um, and actually highest in individuals in polyamorous relationships. However, since uh, like us, many of the weightlifting community are on the right leaning part of the spectrum, you know, they do aspire to be in long-term monogamous relationships. So I pointed out that alongside a second fact, which is that when you have a child as a male, uh, your testosterone decreases. Uh, it's not clear whether this decrease is permanent or temporary only when the child is an infant. But considering that, you know, we are pronatalists and we believe in having lots of kids, you know, I'm going to have an infant in the house uh, constantly over the next 10 years, about. Um, and so uh, then the question becomes, uh, well, if you are, or, so the way I, I use this information uh, was to say, well, so if you were in your like late thirties and you are still swole, it means either you are juicing with artificial source of steroids or uh, yeah, an artificial source of testosterone, or you are a genetic failure. Um, because they are often trying to present this like, oh, you know, I'm very desired because of this i'm extra masculine because of this so we thought we'd do a little inversion of this well, yeah but i mean in other words though i mean what what we were sort of arguing you're looking at is um males seem to hormonally have higher levels of testosterone when their bodies are like oh i'm in go big or go home mode i need to be high risk high reward like until something is telling signaling to my body that i'm in a stable position that i am safe that I am doing well in life, I need to take a lot more risks because that's kind of the male strategy. Um, and if you see someone whose body is is apparently hormonally op optimized around taking risks, the, the insinuation 
is that that body is responding to signals of I'm failing. I'm alone. I am not loved. I am not secure. I am not safe. And I don't feel safe. And I don't have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so I'm going to take a few steps. So testosterone actually does decrease in individuals when they're not in positions of local dominance in their social hierarchy. Yeah. When they're sort of giving up. Yeah. 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 Unemployed people have lower testosterone. Yeah. So yeah, if you do give up, like if you submit yourself to a system where you are at the bottom of a social hierarchy, your testosterone does go down. So it's not absolutely true what you're saying, but the larger piece of their being that males as a human gender are sort of the disposable gender. And this isn't just like a cultural thing. It is to a large extent, historically, biologically true. You know, one man could have many wives, um, but there was not an increase in reproductive capacity if one woman had uh, many male partners. Um, and because of this, uh, testosterone um, in males, um, it causes a lot of negative effects. It, uh, it's, it's really sort of eating away at your body the longer you have testosterone. And, and it does a lot of other things that can cause like shorter lifespans and stuff, you know, causing increased risk-taking behavior, stuff like that. But all of those things are useful if you are trying to secure a mate. However, once your body is like, oh, you are no longer disposable to the tribe and to your community and to your kids and family, like your genetic line, uh, it does naturally decrease your testosterone levels uh, because that would obviously be the genetically optimal thing to do, you know, for the long run. Um, but yeah, so it is your body's way of saying when you are in these high testosterone states that it thinks it has a chance of succeeding, but it doesn't think you are currently succeeding. Yeah. So anyway, we we made that dig. We actually made that dig for a reason. Um, so per our general um, theory about how ideas spread, especially on Twitter, reasonable ideas ride on waves of hate and anger. So all that was sort of meant to anger a certain group on Twitter. However, the larger purpose of this was to make a comment about where society is, especially vis-a-vis pronatalism, which is a cause that's important to us. So we live in a society that for both men and women idolizes a life stage that really should be only idolized when you are an adolescent. So um, both men and women, even in much later stages of life, are incentivized to appear physically like a very fertile adolescent or like 20 something human um, instead of as like a parent or a mentor or a tribal elder. Um, and so a lot of Madonna, people- Madonna, I'm just thinking of the, the ghoulish sort of, you know, <laughs> trying to look like a child, continue. Well, and you, I mean, you see this a ton, you know, you see this with like a lot of media figures, especially women, like still trying to look like teenage girls, which is, it's not a great look. So we're, we're trying to comment on the fact that that's happening. And uh, a comparison that you really made, which I love, has to do with a, a okay, child so celebrity. This. this is another thing that we included in the tweet said that went really well. And it's, yeah. I, 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 I do really love this comparison and I make it all the time, which is as a person goes through life, you go through sort of multiple puberty-like stages. Uh, before you go through puberty, people warn you the things that make you happy are going to change, your biochemistry is going to change. Uh, the way you relate to your environment is going to change. And we all recognize this, even if we haven't gotten past this, the teen stage, which I think many people in society haven't because we've kind of been brainwashed, but everyone can remember how much fun it was to imagine and how it's really hard to keep enjoying that now, even if you try, even if we like stopped right now and played the floor is lava and maybe had a little bit of fun, it wouldn't be quite the same. Exactly. All right, sorry, we cut the tape there because we wanted to make a note for a future episode uh, because it's really important to remember that uh, you are the descendant and only the descendant of people who went through this change during puberty or mostly people who went through this change during puberty that motivated them to do things that led to them having kids. For men, that's often uh, getting obsessed with sex and sexuality. However, you are also the descendant of men who were successful parents. And that requires a very different set of optimization patterns, desires, everything like that. So the same way that the things that make you happy change, the, the, your sources of, of, of desire change when you go through puberty, um, the same thing happens again after you have kids because your biology is tooled to do this. 
Um, and the same thing happens again when you go through menopause or you enter this elder stage, like after the kids leave your house. Um, and we actually argue in our books often that one of the core reasons that you have so much, uh, you know, uh, sadness or like middle-aged drama in our society is people are trying to masturbate sort of emotional sets that were relevant in their teenage years, but aren't relevant to parents or, or people in their like 30s or 40s, or aren't relevant to older adults. Um, in the same way that it'd be very hard for me to get the same amount of happiness my kid does from playing with toy fire trucks. So where does Andrew Tate come into this? Well, it's interesting to us because he is a representation of uh, sort of an immediately post-puberty male's iteration of what they think the perfect adult life is like in the same way that Blippi, a children's character, uh, he um, is similar to like a Blue's Clues sort of guy, I don't know, Scott or whatever from Blue's Clues, where he would uh, dance around uh, fire trucks or uh, police cars about how happy he is and pushing the buttons and playing with toys. And as a young kid, you look at this and you're like, this guy has the best life. But as an adult, you see sort of the soullessness in his eyes because you know no adult is actually enjoying that. Um, and in the same way, you know, as an adult, when you go and you watch these Andrew Tate interviews, you see him being trapped in these scenarios that he doesn't want to be in. Um, uh, for example, uh, I love one interview. He's like, yeah, you know, I need to have sex with these women multiple times a day. Um, and it's really like a job because if I'm not doing a good job pleasing them, then they lose loyalty and that loses an income source for me. And you could tell like he was really sort of uh, beholden to this lifestyle he was not interested in. And I know to a young guy, the idea of having to please multiple women a day to a certain level of satisfactory. That sounds great. That sounds like <laughs> heaven. To an adult man with kids, you're like, oh my God, am I like some some stud horse? It's, it's you know, that is not fun. Um, and it's hard to imagine how your biology is going to change before you are genetically successful, before you do have a lot of kids that you are raising with a woman who's dedicated to you. And so but I you think what the, the whole Twitter thing really yeah. revealed to me, especially based on the way people reacted to it. And we have a whole theory around what makes you react to something with offense. In other words, we, you know, if someone accuses you of something completely ridiculous and preposterous that you don't think could possibly be true, you won't be offended because it's not even close to being true. There's nothing threatening about that statement. Um, but it did seem that that a lot of weightlifting community members on Twitter were deeply offended by what we said, which implied to us that there was a kernel of truth. And and to me, I think that that's, you know, it's more than just Andrew Tate, like, you know, exemplifying people chasing after this well, unsustainable. Um, to, or yeah, I'd no love to go with this thread, but to wrap up the, the previous thread, um, the reason why it's important for us to disintermediate this and the reason why we're interested in disintermediating it isn't just for pronatalism. Um, well, it is partially for pronatalism, but the idea uh, that we are selling to young people that they will be satisfied living the ideal life of a 20 something when they're in their thirties and forties. And that's the life they often plan for and make costly sacrifices around won't actually make them satisfied as an adult. Um, and it will actually be deeply unsatisfying as an adult. Um, and, and you are biologically optimized in the same way your ancestors were to sort of go through this cycle of having kids and everything like that. And um, when you optimize around figures like Andrew Tate, uh, it will lead to deep systemic unhappiness and, and sort of desperate behavior patterns as you get older. Now, well, but also it's, it's worse than that, Malcolm, because then, okay, let's say that you make lifelong decisions around this as, mm -hmm. as a younger person, that's really damaging. But then think about the, the years of dissatisfaction you're going to have as an adult and then an older adult, as you continue to try to chase after a standard that becomes increasingly difficult to obtain. Like we had even people like, <clears throat> DM us that we're friends who were saying, oh, well, I've had kids, but I still lift. Like I can, you know, I'm still swole. Like I, you know, people saying things like that. 
And yes, they, you can absolutely do that. You can you can look jacked as long as you want in life, you know, without hair steroids or with steroids. Like either way, you can do it. It becomes increasingly harder. And I think the same exists for women. Women, you know, will have, you know, they'll get older, whether or not they have kids, their body will change. And it becomes increasingly harder to continue to look like an adolescent female. And after a point, you stop really pulling it off. And no matter how many cosmetic surgeries you get, um, even if you really are like top of the line cosmetic surgery, everything is perfect, you age really well, you're still never going to be able to compete with a you know, a 23 year old woman, if you're, if you're a, a middle-aged woman and as a man, you're not going to be able to compete with a teenage boy in terms of being able to maintain a high level of metabolism, to be able to, you know, bounce back from hangovers as much to be able to build muscles easily. And so I think the other thing that's really important is that people are setting themselves up, not just for dissatisfaction, not like, oh, this isn't giving me all the joy it could, but like for active cognitive dissonance and for like a losing game. And I think that's a huge deal. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Now to the other point you're talking about offense, because I do want to, I just thought that, that was an interesting, I, a point I really wanted to make before we moved on from this topic. Um, so let's talk about offense. So if, <laughs> no, we might have a kid sneaking on, on frame here in a second. When I was, uh, uh, when we went viral uh, for this whole elite couple thing. Yeah, what's up? You want to you wanna hop in here and say hi to people? Here, they saw you when you were just a baby. Hey, Octavian. What are you doing? Are you, you homesick? No, you don't. Well, can you go back up to Dada's room? You can't because you want to see me. You are so sweet. Okay. Aww. Offense as a concept. Now let's touch on that. When we were uh, sort of going viral as this elite couple thing, one of the people, a guy with a lot of followers, He's like, uh, don't you know that this couple isn't real? They're, they're models. Uh, this is not like, this is what the pronatalist movement wants you to believe that they look like. And his followers were like, no, no, no. Like I did some investigation. Like I understand why you could think that or they do look like models, but they're not models. And by this, what I mean is from third parties. Third parties that don't like us and want to make fun of our movement, they say we look like models. So when people attack us for being unattractive, I know, like, objectively, that doesn't really hurt my feelings when they're like, oh, you're ugly or weird or freakish looking. I'm like, well, I don't think so. Oh, you're making sure everyone can see the show that you're watching? <laughs> well, now, Malcolm, but I... I but hold on, hold on. Let's let's continue to go down this this chain here. Um, but and, and in addition, if somebody were to say something that was just patently untrue, like if they were to say, Simone, you're fat, or Malcolm, you're fat, I'd be like, that doesn't cause me offense. Or they're to say something that I already accept about myself. Like, Malcolm, you are not swole. A lot of people were like, you are not swole. You, you don't even lift, bro. Like, you don't, you, I doubt you could lift X. And it's like, well, Yes, I accept that about myself. That is not a dominance hierarchy I'm willing to I'm looking to climb. So that doesn't cause offense in me. Um, and so the way that you cause a type of offense that causes people to pick up on something is you have to say something that uh, a person doesn't want to be true and doesn't accept as true, but is plausibly true, even from their own perspective. You have to credibly challenge their worldview. And you were going to say something, Simone? Oh, well, I thought you were actually going to, I, you probably want to say what would actually really offend. Ah, uh, so, well, this Twelve is Twitter. where it got interesting. So uh, this community did something that was really bizarre to me, which was, um, yeah, uh, when they were upset with us, um, they would try to like hurt our feelings by either saying stuff that just obviously wouldn't offend us because either we know it's not true or we accept it about ourselves or by sending us pictures of like them weightlifting. Right here, right here, Daddy. Oh yeah, this is my Coke. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yeah, it does need to be recycled, but you see there's still coconut. So they would do things like send us videos of themselves working out or looking really swole as a way to, I think, attempt to like attack us or show that they were higher in a status hierarchy than us. And they would often, when they were attacking us, be like, I doubt you even lift or I doubt you can even lift X, which is really fascinating because this sort of swole community is part of a status hierarchy where you can sort of immediately judge somebody's status relevant relative to yourself based on how much muscle they have. Um, but we are not part of that status hierarchy. Like we have no interest in that. And mainstream society largely doesn't have an interest in it either. Uh, and so it's very odd. It would be like if you made fun of Goss and then a bunch of Goss sent you stuff like, I doubt you've even listened to Cradle of Filth. <laughs> um, or like, I, I, I have this test of Goss trivia for you. Or like, I doubt you even have X pierced. And it's like, yes, I'm, I'm not a goth. So it was a very odd thing. And so I was like, you know, actually, I could really school them on how to hurt somebody's feelings. Um, and I told her a tweet we could do. And she's like, Malcolm, no, you can't do that. That is actually too mean of a tweet. Um, and so it's to say, I am really understanding the weightlifting community. And genuinely, I am. Like, I used to follow Swole Hate. I understand it's a community that's unfairly maligned. Like, we really shouldn't have been making fun of them. It's, it's got a wholesome side to it. Um, and a lot of the people in it are in this wholesome side. You know, the, the, the bad guys in it are, are the minority. Um, and it is really the only option for a lot of people. So if you are a guy, as some guys are, and you are born short, and there's not a lot you can do about that, or you're born not very smart, and there's not a lot you can do about that. Uh, the a way you can raise your status and have total control over is weightlifting. Um, and this is why I think you often see weightlifting combined with get rich quick schemes as well, um, in terms of communities that are adjacent to each other. Uh, you know, this sort of like hustle culture guy stuff. It's because, you know, they're trying to raise their status. Uh, guys who hear these pitches of like, we can help you improve. Um, you know, obviously one of those pitches, these sort of get rich quick guys like, oh, you got to read a hundred books and then do this and then do this and then drop shipping. But the truth is, is only one or 2% of guys who subscribe to these sort of gurus actually do end up making any money. Most of them are just hemorrhaging money. What's interesting about the weightlifting community is the vast majority of people who actually follow through and put in the effort do gain muscle and do raise in status within that community and have some moderate augmentation of status within the wider world. Um, and something we note here, you know, like when we talk about attacking a person's, the, the reason why that hurts people is because it's partially true. They know that that's the reason they're doing this. It's the way they can improve themselves that they actually have control over. And I don't want to belittle the amount of work that, that goes into it only to say that I would always recommend, especially, uh, you know, as you become older as a man to stop optimizing over this use definition of masculine perfection and focus on other forms of uh, self-improvement that might contribute to the world more or contribute to sort of your cultural faction or contribute to aspects of your family more. And or when you want to insult someone, you need to try to model them as effectively as you can. Yeah. Model their values and their aspirations um, and then attempt to attack that because that is the only way that you will actually offend them, um, which actually dovetails with our, our theory of anger. So if you wanna anger someone, mm -hmm don't treat them in accordance with how they expect to be treated. That's your theory on anger, Malcolm. Whereas offending yeah, so someone means pointing out something about their worldview that kind of questions a fundamental underpinning in a way that's very scary. The core thing that causes anger, we argue in our books, um, is when somebody or the world uh, doesn't react to you or something you have done in the way that you expect them to. Um, so this can be, you've turned your car keys, you expect your car to turn on and it doesn't turn on and you do it a few times and you become increasingly angry. Um, but it could also be somebody doesn't engage you properly. And so this can be a big problem when you have cultural misalignment. So like you see this with the trans community, right? Like they expect to be gendered one way and then somebody doesn't gender them one way and that causes anger. Um, uh, whereas the other community doesn't think that other people should be able to tell them how they gender them. And so when they are corrected in how they gender somebody, that causes anger. And so you have this anger spiral. Um, and you see this in a lot of communities. Uh, and that is a, a problem. Uh, and it's also a problem in relationships as well. Uh, when there is uh, misaligned expectations of how each of the couples uh, should engage with each other. Yeah. So... Wise words on Twitter. 
<laughs> courtesy of Malcolm with help from Octavian, our wonderful little blonde. Do you want to say child. bye? You can cut and then you can have him skip, come say and say bye. Okay. Okay. You want to say bye? Bye. And you like Thanks, spending time Octavian. with Mama and Dada and her, their friends on, on camera? Is there anything that you want to say to yeah, the world, Octavian? I would be the good kid. You will be the good kid? You will be the good kid. Good. So you promise our, our, our fans on YouTube that you'll be a good kid? <laughs> Silence. You're not, you're not sure? We love you, Octavian. We love you. <laughs> you say to the fans, I love you too. I love you too, Daddy. <laughs> oh, you're a sweetheart. <laughs>